Welcome to the 446th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, and I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today, I welcome healthcare historian Gian McKee. Just a reminder, you can usually catch COVID Calls live on weekdays at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at USO Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. And as always, please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of March 3rd, 2022, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center, 955,691 people have died of COVID-19 in the United States. 8,394 people have died of COVID-19 in South Korea. I've been reading an obituary or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic. I'd like to continue that reading now. The headline, Richard S. Dunn, eminent historian, professor, and author, dies at 93. This was written by Gary Miles and appeared March 1st, 2022, in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Richard S. Dunn, age 93, formerly of Philadelphia, an award-winning professor emeritus of American history at the University of Pennsylvania, Director Emeritus of the groundbreaking McNeil Center for Early American Studies, Co-Executive Officer Emeritus of the American Philosophical Society, and a prolific researcher and author, died Monday, January 24th, 2022, of congestive heart failure and COVID-19 at his home in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. A renowned expert on early American and Caribbean history, he was a professor at Penn for 40 years. He chaired the school's history department from 1972 to 1977, helped recruit its first tenured women faculty members, and won the school's 1993 Lindback Award for Distinguished Teaching. Professor Dunn formed the Philadelphia Center for Early American Studies, now called the McNeil Center for Early American Studies, in 1977 and led that until 2000 in various leadership roles. The center's Richard S. Dunn Fellowship recognizes excellence in scholarship and its head of staff holds the Richard S. Dunn Directorship. In an online tribute, current director, historian Emma Hart said, Richard's legacy will endure far beyond his lifetime. In 2002, Professor Dunn and his wife, Mary Maples Dunn became co-executive officers of the Philadelphia-based American Philosophical Society and for six years, they oversaw, among other things, the society's initiatives on research fellowships, exchange scholars, endowments, and building renovations. A well-traveled researcher, Professor Dunn edited, wrote, and reviewed numerous papers, books, and articles. His 1972 book, Sugar and Slaves, The Rise of the Planter Class in the English West Indies, 1624 to 1713, was a 1973 National Book Award finalist in history. And his 2014 book, A Tale of Two Plantations, Slave Life and Labor in Jamaica and Virginia won the 2015 Annisfield Wolf Book Award for nonfiction. He also won other awards and fellowships and was a member of many scholarly organizations. He earned the 2017 American Historical Association's Award for Scholarly Distinction and was a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. As an Historical editor should, I try to present my findings so as to encourage the reader to draw his or her own conclusions. He said in a 2015 interview with the Junto blog on early American history, he told the Harvard Gazette in 2015, I've had a good deal of experience of writing history from the top down, but now I'm trying to write history from the bottom up. In an online tribute, former students called Professor Dunn a historical giant, praised his alert and humane scholarship. Colleagues noted his kind heart, generous soul, and extraordinary integrity. Born August 9th, 1928 in Minneapolis, Professor Dunn graduated from St. Paul Academy and Harvard. He earned his master's degree and doctorate in history at Princeton, taught at Princeton and the University of Michigan before joining Penn in 1957. He met Mary Maples, a fellow historian, then teaching at Bryn Mawr, 
at a history convention and they married in 1960. They had daughters, Rebecca and Cece, and lived in Philadelphia and St. David's. His wife became president of Smith College in 1985, and Professor Dunn traveled often between Philadelphia and New England. Reveling in his role as partner to his wife and entertaining host to her colleagues, students, and friends, she died in 2017. And of the Eagles, 76ers and Phillies, Professor Dunn liked to tell of the time he got bowled over courtside by Sixers star Charles Barkley. He enjoyed opera and the Philadelphia Orchestra and recited Shakespeare on Zoom meetings with fellow enthusiasts. He was a very caring human being, said his daughter Cece. He was always interested in what we were doing. He was a model for me. His daughter Rebecca said, I enjoyed talking things through with him. He always gave great advice. In addition to his daughters, Professor Dunn is survived by three grandchildren and other relatives. A brother died earlier. The obituary of Richard S. Dunn, historian who died January 24th of congestive heart failure and COVID. Okay, I'd like to turn to the conversation for today, and let me introduce my guest, Gian McKee. Gian McKee serves as Associate Professor of Presidential Studies at the University of Virginia's Miller Center of Public Affairs, where he's also co-director of the center's new healthcare policy initiative. He's the author of Hospital City, Healthcare, Nation, Race, Capital, and the Costs of American Healthcare, which will be published in February of next year by the University of Pennsylvania Press. He's also the author of The Problem of Jobs, Liberalism, Race, and Deindustrialization in Philadelphia, which appeared in 2008 with Chicago Press. And he's the editor or co-editor of five volumes in the Miller Center's Presidential Recordings of Lyndon Johnson series. Ian McKee, welcome to COVID Calls. It's good to see you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for having me. It's great to see you too like to start the way I generally do, just find out where you're calling from and what the pandemic situation is looking like there. Sure. I'm calling from Charlottesville, Virginia. And um, just to make for your uh, listeners don't necessarily know the geography, we're about 90 miles southwest of Washington, D.C., about 60 miles west of Richmond. And uh, where that is with location of the University of Virginia, which is my, my academic affiliation. And the situation here... Um, uh, I would say is is markedly improved. Um, the this part of Virginia had its kind of uh, Omicron peak in uh, late January, about January 25th, as I was looking at the data, and has come down pretty rapidly since then. Um, that said, it's the cases are still higher than they were um, back in late November, early December. And if we look at the CDC's new guidelines, we are actually among the 30% of American communities that still are in the high area. And if you look at those county maps, it's interesting. There's a swath of orange, of high through kind of Kentucky and West Virginia, sort of Northern Appalachia. And we are right on the edge of that. If you go north and east of us, just one county, you hit the yellow. And by the time you get to Northern Virginia, it's it's now green. So it's kind of an interesting rolling pattern that we've kind of followed the rest of the state down. I should also note it's an interesting moment here in Virginia because our new governor, Glenn Youngkin, uh, along with the General Assembly, uh, passed a law uh, of banning school mask mandates. And that took effect this Tuesday. So uh, we're kind of in a new era in um, this grand experiment that uh, we're, we're all undertaking. And um, I can report anecdotally at our local schools, the mask wearing is still, still very high. That's an anecdote of one of the student I have in, in the schools. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's that obviously varies a lot location to location. Well, thank you for that, for situating us and for that update. I was talking to um, disaster law scholar Kathy Birkin just last night, and we were talking about the mask mandate issue, and she was sort of walking me through kind of the legal terrain of this. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, you know, to think about it for a second that, you know, it, it's what governors had to do in states that didn't expressly give them that power to put a mask mandate. There was legislation passed in some states early in the pandemic. And now to come to this arc where in some states the legislature have expressly 
taken that power away from the governor right. and from other elected officials across the state. It's it's not a pathway I would have predicted, but there's so much about this pandemic and how culture has become twisted up with it that's been astounding to me. I, I wonder what you think about this mask mandate ban. Yeah, well, the, the fascinating thing I, to me is really right on exactly those lines is that Virginia's law takes the authority it's not about the governor, it takes it away from localities and local school divisions. And you and I are old enough to remember when a core conservative principle was deference to localities who determine their own their own course. And we're now in a, a very different world. And, um, you know, it, it's reflective of how politicized uh, all of this ha has become. Um, you know, and I, I think you're seeing that uh, certainly in some of the uh, Democratic governors, Glenn Youngkin's Republican, but the Democratic governors that uh, voluntarily lifted their mandates, they left it up to local option. Um, you know, but it's it's become something where it's now, um, you know, for a, at least a large segment of the conservative uh, part of the, the population, one of these markers of, um, you know, what, what they expect of, of their leadership to take aggressive action to limit local authority. His His election, so his campaign, the timing is a little bit off of the normal, um, you know, midterm right. cycle. So we got a preview, maybe, of what some Republican office holders. I'm, I, and maybe it's going to be different for people running for, um, you know, local congressional seats versus running for statewide offices. I don't know, um, but you know, Virginia is an interesting. I mean, it's like Pennsylvania. You got everything in one state ideologically. Yes. So he wanted to go after. Um, the status quo of COVID best practice, I think, but he wanted to, he did it in a very particular way, which is to focus it on the schools. And I, I, I wanted to just, um, just linger on this for just one second more. Is that, is that part of some sort of broader politics that you've kind of charted over time around schools as a weather vane, uh, you know, for maybe new ideological trends in Republican or Democratic politics? Yeah. Um, well, a couple of nuances. I mean, I think um, uh, Youngkin's, Youngkin, the, the margins of Youngkin's victory, I think, were heavily in the suburbs of Northern Virginia and Richmond. And Northern Virginia in particular had some very long school closures. Uh, we did as well, but not quite as long even as, as Northern Virginia. And I think the frustration there as a result of that among a lot of parents um, uh, was something that he played very effectively towards. And you had some of the, you know, critical race theory stuff as well, but I think that was more of a factor there in getting the, you know, Trump voter who might not typically show up in a, go to, in a governor's race to come out and vote. Um, so that's a related but slightly mm -hmm. different issue. And then, of course, I think um, the, the Democratic candidate, Terry McAuliffe, really walked into that buzzsaw with an unfortunate comment he made about how parents shouldn't have, you know, I, I, I don't want, I'm, not, I'm not getting the quote exactly right, but parents shouldn't have control or input into their, their kids' education. And Youngkin ran with that and really pay, played to that frustration. And I think it's, it's partly, um, you know, the, talking about best practices are really, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, at, at that time, you know, you can certainly make an argument that was best practice, uh, but so much of this we are learning as we go uh, right. as right. to you know, what, what was safe or what is safe, um, what might have been unsafe at that time. Um, we now, you know, and now it's, it's different. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's one of these tricky things of the relationship between science and, and, and politics. As to the, the larger trajectory of education politics, yes, absolutely. I think this is something we can run you know, back through uh, all kinds of issues. The, um, the textbook wars of the, 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 the 1990s, the debate over national education standards, and mm -hmm. what you, how you teach American history, which has, of course, become very live again. And then I probably also go back to the history of school busing and racial integration in schools. And as you know, that's a story of housing integration as much as it is yeah. of, of school integration and the way that we allocate resources, who gets to go to school where, who gets to live where, and the, the spatial 
uh, relationships of um, uh, uh, political economy and, and race in this country's history. So yeah, I think it's mm. a thread that of uh, uh, attention over uh, power, over control, over how we um, assess evidence in a sense. That, that sounds very clinical and, and social scientific, but when we play it out into the culture, you know, that's and, and um, political debates, that's really what I think it kind of is. Mm. Particularly when we tie it back to, to COVID policy. Thanks for talking about Virginia politics. Um, yeah. You know, people often say, you know, I'm from Texas, so sometimes people say, oh, Texas, follow Texas because that's the future of American politics. I, I, I follow Virginia and Pennsylvania because yeah. I tend to think that those are states um, where we're going to see the preview of, of things to come in, in upcoming elections. Let me just remind folks that you're listening to COVID calls. I'm talking to historian Guillen McKee today. Ian, I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing a personal memory of this pandemic period for you. Sure. Um, well, let's see. You know, and I, I should say, I, you know, I've, I've been in a lot of sense, in most senses, the most important senses, have been lucky. I haven't lost anyone particularly close. I've been, been very fortunate, uh, you know, very privileged in, I, you know, my ability to stay safe and, um, you know, keep my, my family safe and obviously a certain amount of luck. Um, so, you know, I don't have, you know, that that kind of grievous um, experience that so many people unfortunately do. Um, but it actually does, I think, raise another insight, and that's the the smaller losses of the pandemic. Um, and my older son was uh, graduated from high school last year. And so I think if I, you know, go right to the core of my experience, it was that process of, um, you know, March of his junior year, high school shutting down, you know, and then the everything that came with um, the uncertainty, um, uh, not having it at all a normal some senior year, we were able to get certain things back that were important. Sports started up in January, which is a big part of his life. Uh, we went back to school twice, twice, two days a week in, in March. So he had some in-person school. But things like, you know, we didn't do college visits. You know, he saw his college campus the day we dropped him off in August. And so for me, I think it's that. It's that, um, you know, it's not, you know, a loss of someone's life or, or something that crucial. But, you know, the, the smaller experiences have have value and meaning, too. And I think... Um, I think we 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 have to keep that in obviously proportion, but it's worth acknowledging those too. I think that um, particularly some of the the strain and psychological burden that we all feel come from those those smaller life experiences that uh, at least were changed and um, you know to some extent shifted. I will say you know he's been resilient and he's had a you know ended up you know at a college he loves and having a great freshman year. So um, you know. Life does, you know, you know, find a way. So. I'm glad to hear that, and I appreciate you sharing those insights. And and early, and I think it's been a struggle throughout the pandemic, and particularly early on in the pandemic, um, for people to talk about those kind of losses. Yeah. Because yeah. obviously, the gravity of the pandemic is enormous, and it's hard to you can't possibly. I struggle with this constantly with the numbers, and we try to tell individual life stories. Um, but then there's also, I mean, if you really think about it, I mean, I interviewed high school students in the spring of 2020. Uh, there's only a couple times in your life where you assemble all of your family. Right, right, absolutely. You know, for, for people who have the ability to do that, it'd be your, you know, your high school graduation and your wedding. Yeah. And and that's not only for the, for the, for the high school student may be a little bit ambivalent about that, but for the <laughs> parents and the grandparents, it's the real deal. And you yeah. thought about it and prepared for it for many, many years, and then to have it like shut down. Yeah, it's the it's the loss of the rituals, you know, of, of um, I agree. You know, you know, things that mark one's passage through life and one's relationships to the people you care most about. And um, yeah, I, I think it's important to recognize those. I've talked with people about that in terms of funerals too, and and mm -hmm. challenges and how different families have dealt with that, and the question of whether or not to just try to go forward with the funeral by distance and just adapt as best you can, or to yeah. somehow delay it. But then this pandemic has been so brutally out of phase with mm -hmm. us, and every yeah. time we think we're into some sort of plateau, it's like no, here's more, right. So then yeah. you keep deferring these 
moments of life to some yeah. point where it just becomes absurd, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that explains a lot of the, the psychological fatigue. And I think as, as people who study policy, pay attention to policy or, you know, you know, some folks, the, the opportunity to influence policy, it's, it's something that, uh, is worth being aware of in thinking about, um, about strategies moving forward. I think it may explain some of what we're seeing in the, um, you know, the, the adaptations that even that have happened in the last week. Hmm. So um, what do you have in mind specifically? Um, I'm thinking uh, specifically about the shift in uh, CDC masking guidelines, right. uh, but also the, the national preparedness plan that the, the okay. White House issued yesterday. Uh, we can dig into that now or, can, you know, whatever. But, uh, yeah, let me just quickly remind folks. I mean, I love talking to you because we can talk about any topic, but we should talk about healthcare and and emergency preparedness of the areas that you're really working on closely right now, talking to Guy and McKee on COVID calls. So that national preparedness plan just dropped. Take us inside. Yeah. Well, you know, the way I like to think about this is um, this is an attempt to uh, do two things. It's to organize what has been a very chaotic, <laughs> to put it mildly, uh, response by the U.S. government to the pandemic and to really map out a strategy going forward. And secondly, that strategy uh, is about finding ways to adapt to the reality of a virus that's going to be present with us. And I, I actually, that, that term is mine, uh, to adapt. I, and. Um, I, I really have uh, rejected the idea of living with a virus. Uh, I think that's a really problematic concept because I think there's a, a degree of fatalism. Um, there's a degree of giving up. There really is in that, I think, um, an unfortunate, very problematic element of leaving people behind <laughs> who are more vulnerable. And that's going to be one of our, our big challenges. I was pleased to see, although they didn't use the word adapt, I don't think, the White House did actively reject living with the virus. And so they're trying to, trying to present a proactive strategy. Um, it's a, across a, a number of areas, um, uh, uh, essentially protecting from uh, people from, from the vaccine and future surges or, or variants, um, expanding vaccination, um, let's see, I can watch the categories here, um, uh, preparing for new, new variants, preventing further shutdowns, and then um, global vaccination. And they have point by point um, strategies in each of those areas, which really, I think, do reflect a combination of the new um, tools that we have available from antivirals to wastewater uh, um, uh, screening of um, uh, for for new variants for for uh, surges of the virus that if applied you know, <laughs> comprehensively and funded which is i think really the the key give us a possibility for um moving this forward in a more more organized uh and more effective manner than we've seen to to this point now you know the 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 devil is not just in the execution but it's also in the united states congress that right. much of this to really be able to implement it effectively at scale is going to require infusions of of funding congress is going to have to um to to be willing to spend more money on this um you know, the, I, the administration's planning to ask for $30 billion. I saw an, uh, an estimate, I think it's a Zeke Emanuel from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really going to be more like $100 billion to do this right. Now, you may be able to phase that in over an, a number of years, but, you know, the, the cost of effectively managing what we hope is an endemic stage of COVID um, are still going to be substantial. And, um I choose to be optimistic that uh, Congress, for all of its flaws, will see that that's a you know, highly worthwhile investment to make in, um, you know, just at, at an economic level before we even get to the, um, uh, uh, the human costs of not doing this right. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Um, it's it's you know, obviously difficult at this point where you've got the kind of partisan divides 
and now the concerns over inflation and you know as world events reassert yeah. themselves this week the possibility of losing focus so I, I have a i i like a lot of the strategy i like the degree to which it's very there's a great degree of emphasis on equity on doing what's what's possible for um you know people for example who are immunocompromised uh mm -hmm. to provide protection um but yeah you know i um you know, you, you've got to get to the point of being able to execute well, and that means funding it. I have a couple of questions about this. One is, do you think this is as close as we're going to get to a um, to a investigation uh, of of COVID? I've seen no traction coming out of the House or the Senate or the White House for a, a national. And what I was able to glean uh, was that the White House had committed itself to the January sixth commission. Right. And it was too much to ask uh, to have a major commission on that and then a major commission on COVID, which I I just don't want to believe that. But I'm worried that this national preparedness plan may be the only forensic instrument we'll have to understand what went wrong. Yeah, well, I, I, I certainly hope not, because it's 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 really not that um, yeah. it's it's moving. I, I think it's really more a strategy to deploy what we have learned about how to manage COVID um, and some of, as I said, the new new tools that we've we've developed over the last, um, you know, particularly over the last year, which is I think encouraging that there's been an acceleration there. Um, as far as some kind of a commission, um, there is work being done um, towards that. Uh, my uh, colleague at the Miller Center, Philip Zellico, who headed right. the 9/11, it was the executive director of the 9/11 Commission, has uh worked um across people in government former government officials the corporate sector to begin organizing some kind of um a national commission he has had at least some um some traction on capitol hill uh on actually a bipartisan basis mm -hmm. um it's been pretty quiet for I'm trying to remember probably the last two months or so so I honestly don't know where it stands right now, but I, I think there's at least some possibility um, that we might get to that. And I will say this, too, that one of the best things that could happen in general, obviously, but, but for the idea of some kind of a commission would be that we get an extended period of COVID not being uh, the the, the front burner political issue. If we could right. dial that heat down right. for even six months and uh, you, you might have a shot of getting that quietly uh, through. Another possibility, and I think this was more on the table early on, was to do it privately, that this would not actually be a congressionally sanctioned national commission right. simply because of the politics, that it was just too hot but that it would have a kind of unofficial imprimatur, that this would be the major investigation and that you would have serious uh, philanthropic money uh, funding it. Because there, there is some interest in some of the, 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 the big philanthropic organizations with, with real capacity. Right. And that would be another way to get to, to some of the work done. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I think we desperately need this kind of um, full scale assessment of, of what happened, um, you know, what was uh, where the mistakes were made, uh, what was done well. There have been there have been a few right. things, I think, that, that actually, if we take a, a more positive view, there, there's some pretty uh, remarkable accomplishments for all of the failures as well. Um, and really to, to assess what we can learn and prepare for, you know, the unfortunate reality that this probably is not the last pandemic that, that, the, that the world will face. I hope not. I had, a but, yeah. I had a chance to interview um, Phil Zalico a few weeks ago and uh, yeah, yeah, about wonderful. this idea. Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean, he, you know, it was a stunning conversation, the depth that he brings to understanding of how you would put something like this together and the politics of moving it through. Um, and I, and I, I hope it works. I really do. And, but that's, you know, as I bring it back to that national preparedness plan, it's kind of, you know, this is one of these questions people had early in the pandemic, which is, well, haven't, didn't we have a, a plan? Didn't we have pandemic plans? Hadn't the government already been working on this? And it had, you know, ever since, you know, concerns around bioterrorism in the post 9-11 era, there's been yeah. plenty of research. 
Um, I want to get to your other work, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I did want to ask you this one thing, because it talks, it's a sort of an issue around governance in America more generally and disasters, which is, um, does government have, or in what ways does government have the capacity to learn yeah. from disaster? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Um, and you get into this kind of almost this question of agency, you know, what what is government and what does it mean for a, a massive institution like that to learn? And I, I think that it actually does. Uh, but we have to understand it, and maybe it's even um, thinking about it in in terms that are are different from from learning the way a human would learn that it is this multifaceted you know institution across a range of agencies in the United States case of the United States of course fragmented across federal state local which is a huge issue and um, to to be able to coordinate that is in and, and change practices is a huge challenge um, but when the need is really there, as I think it, it clearly is in this case, there are I'm struggling a little bit with how to describe this, but there can be both a, um, a, a comprehensive kind of sweeping assessment, which is the kind of thing that you would get out of a national commission, which I think is unquestionably health, helpful. But you also have things like, um, you know, are things within every agency of the government, if they're being mm. run well, mm. of, uh, after action reports of a sort, right. where you reassess what has happened, what the needs are to have changed simply structurally in terms of funding priorities, um, and the cumulative effect of that um, can lead into, uh, uh, I think, actually, incremental but significant change because every agency that shifts its operations is going to be then interacting with partner agencies that will also ideally be an adjust will it will, will be adjusting as well and the interaction between those uh, reform structures um, has the potential to to make a lot of progress and effectively a form of institutional learning um i'll just point to to one that um mm. I read a little bit about today. I'm certainly not an expert on this, but uh, Department of Health and Human Services stood up an emergency logistics and operations um, project in the early early months of the pandemic. They have now transitioned that into a permanent agency structure um, to to deal with their contribution to you know things like dealing with shortages of, of healthcare personnel or hospital beds that that kind of thing or, or ppe for example right, right. um you know that it's it's not something that you're going to necessarily read about in the the new york times washington post you know their government sections they they, they might cover it um but it's not headline making stuff the way a national commission report uh might be or ideally would be um but it has the potential to uh, significantly shift HHS's capacity. And that's a lot of what we're really talking about is those kind of incremental shifts. Just let me remind folks that you're listening to COVID calls. I'm talking to Guillen McKee today, and I really like that what the way you frame that, which is that um, when we think about government, we have to maybe consider it doesn't learn the way the, the idea of learning from disaster is always out there, but governments learn differently from the way people will learn or even the way that some sort of societal communal, community based learning might work. Uh, and a lot of that is going to be in probably, as you say, trial and error, government, like agency level studies, memory, just institutional memory and small rules changes that are not going to be leading headlines. And I, so that's the kind of close reading of details that I love about your scholarship. And I want to, so let's, let's shift over and talk a little bit about this book you've been working on, Hospital City, Healthcare Nation, Race Capital and the Costs of American Healthcare. So we're not going to see this book, I guess. I can't get my hands on it until, <laughs> until Sadly, next, no. I, next year, but I, I can't wait for that. So I want you to tell me about it now and particularly help me if you could sort of walk through it a little bit and, and then reflect on points where you're thinking 
in that book has been shaped or refracted through COVID. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, 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 I guess I'll start with the origin story of the book, if, if you will. As you know, I, um, I wrote my first book about deindustrialization in Philadelphia and uh, you know, basically the loss of the city's manufacturing base and how they struggled to, uh, to, to address that. And the very early stages of my research for that, um, my now wife was working in a research lab, her first job post-college, um, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And so I would come out of the archive, studying, you know, take the train down through abandoned, you know, factory areas and, you know, North Philadelphia. And I'd arrive in West Philadelphia at this massive, gleaming healthcare complex. And that sort of planted a seed that there's a part of this story of economic change um, that is really tied to healthcare. And it's, it's growth into these massive institutions at the community level. Fast forward more than a decade, and I was drawn uh, mostly through teaching needs, but to some extent, my work on Linda Johnson and the Great Society into looking at healthcare policy specifically, Medicare initially, uh, and Medicaid. And the realization that we spend 18% of GDP on healthcare in the United States, and that these two things are connected that the high costs of American health care play out in American communities all over the country, places like West Philadelphia, but every you know, medium sized or, or small city around the country. They've all got a hospital. And so uh, what I've done in this book is attempt to intertwine um, the local, the state level and the national and really retelling the story of American healthcare around the hospital and around the kind of costs that we have in this country. And um, the, the book includes a, a case study of Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, in East Baltimore, which is a, a, a very low income, now uh, primarily African-American uh, community. Um, and then connecting that into the national story of the drive for healthcare reform. And the, the core of the argument is that we've really misunderstood the nature of the debate over healthcare policy because we haven't paid enough attention to the places where healthcare actually happens. The hospitals and community clinics and all of the institutions around the country where healthcare is delivered. You know, it's not this abstract thing of a percentage of GDP or the structure of an insurance market. I mean, it is those things. Um, but it's uh, the, the places uh, where it takes place and then how uh, people are paid and uh, for, for that work and then what the political implications uh, of that economic and social presence is. And so that's going to be the core of the book and really um, recentering the debate around those kinds of questions and um, uh, uh, thinking about it in, in a new way. And <clears throat> to a certain extent, um, as we turn to COVID, uh, it, it's um, it, the, the, the book places a lot of emphasis on the changes that we've seen over the last uh, really 60 years in how hospitals are funded, particularly their capital funding and their reliance uh, since the 1970s, or I guess really the passage of Medicare on uh, debt markets. Uh, to uh, raise capital and how that's created vast inequities um, within the hospital system itself. Um, and at the same time, how it's then contributed to, and really uh, in a very direct and, and tremendously important way, the high costs of American healthcare. As you've seen, the consolidation of the healthcare system and the development of pricing power by large healthcare systems. So this is really uh, probably the biggest driver of the excess costs of the American healthcare system relative to other developed countries. Um, and uh, that, that plays out with the pandemic in a couple of different ways. One of the most striking studies that I've seen um, of, of COVID-19 and its consequences was in the um, uh, 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 JAMA Open Network last, um, last fall. And this was a large scale study of about 44,000 Medicare recipients uh, who are 
hospitalized in um, almost 1,200 U.S. hospitals. And uh, once you control for all other you know, social, economic factors, the Black uh, African-American death rate was 11% higher. And that was completely explained by the hospital where they were treated. That was the critical wow. variable. That it, you know, if you were treated at a hospital with a higher death rate, you tended to have a much worse outcome. And African Americans were disproportionately treated at those hospitals. So that's you know one of the kind of core connections is that all of these structures of financing, the connection to uh, the wealth of a community, the connection to racial discrimination and housing, all of these things have played out in really pretty direct ways in the pandemic. Um, at the same time, of course, you know, the book in many respects is very critical of the healthcare system and the hospital system in particular. But then, of course, we've seen the you know, positive sides of our hospital right. system in another sense of the heroic actions of the actual clinical workers, um, who, of course, are not necessarily the, even the majority of that, that workforce, but the people on the front lines uh, and the sacrifices that, that they've made. So this tension of, on the one hand, uh, the system that's inefficient, that uh, has tremendous implications for uh, disparity and, and inequity, uh, but on which we also um, re rely in, the, the, um, in, in this kind of a, a disastrous crisis. Well, I, the scope of it is really impressive and important. And, and I really appreciate the way that you connect it to your, um, to your first book, The Problem of Jobs, Liberalism, Race, and Deindustrialization in Philadelphia, which is essential reading. Um, you know, don't, you don't have to be a Philadelphia aficionado to read this book to understand, because it really patiently walks through the various different dynamics of deindustrialization. Um, in, and one of the things I really like about that book, too, is it you pay attention to the, the culture of optimism and hope and possibility in cities, which was running headlong into the reality of economic shifts, which were often outside of the control of urban centers, even ones as big as, as Philadelphia. And that they were in the middle of a shift that they couldn't comprehend. And, and I think that, and so this, what you're talking about, the healthcare system and hospital system seems to fall within the similar kind of, kind of problem, which is that urban planners and, and you know, people who are committed to, even committed to justice and equity in urban governance, they've been fighting against trends that are outside of their control. I mean, I'm simplifying this slightly. We would like to think that there's a command center in every city hall that they can say, yes, we need this many hospitals and we need this much investment. And this is the way the university needs to interact with city hall. And, uh, and, but it, it hasn't worked that that way in a long time, maybe if it ever worked that way. Yeah. Yeah, um, never really yeah. 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 No, I think that's a, that's a great point. And, and really part of this, this issue is that the healthcare system and particularly the, the hospital system really is fragmented. Um, you know, that there, there's no, um, there is no capacity uh, to, to plan centrally, to allocate resources efficiently. And, it, and interestingly, we can extend that not just on the governmental and the planning side, but on the market side either. You know, that's another point I really emphasize is in my view, uh, market forces, should you wanna go that, that route, don't work at all in healthcare either. Uh, this goes back, you know, 60 years to the work of the economist Kenneth Arrow and the, uh, the difficulty of actually having competitive forces work in an environment where, you know, you don't even have clear prices. Um, you know, in, in, in this field and, you know, let alone the ability to as really as a consumer uh, to assess the quality of the product that you're receiving, uh, even if you weren't under the stress of, of an emergency medical condition. Um, so this is this is one of the, the dilemmas is we don't have planning. We tried to to a point rely on markets, but markets don't work either. And the result is a system that, uh, you know, is, is sprawling, um, is inefficient. We have hospitals mm -hmm. in rural America in particular 
that are and inner cities to some degree too uh, that financially are really um, not viable. For example, in 2020, we had about 25 hospitals actually close, even as we were in the midst of this this uh, you know horrible situation where we didn't seem to have enough hospital beds, at least at the, the worst points of the surge. Um, so there are all these pieces that um, that kind of swirl around, and they've all kind of come you know, back on us over the last few years, I think. Let me just um, remind folks you're listening to COVID calls. And I, um, there's a piece of this I wanted to to hear from you a little bit more about, which is about, again, about the pandemic and, and the culture of attachment to hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, I've had Nick Ramos on as a guest and I had George Armwat, um, Omwat on as a guest. And of course, these are brilliant scholars working around um, many different aspects of what, what it means to have hospitals or hospital provision, the sort of rationing, the scarcity of hospitals, and then also the racial and LGBT dimensions of LGBTQ dimensions of that, which they both work on. In the middle of this pandemic, we got a national, a global demonstration of the, of the, the power of the hospital and the, mm -hmm. and the, not just as a place to try to save lives, but also as an empathetic place. And then we got that in a strange way because families couldn't go in. So all of a sudden you realize the absence of that ability for people to be close, ideally close to home, to a loved one who was who was suffering. So I guess my question in a certain sense is like, can culture overcome bureaucracy and politics? Is it possible we're at a moment where Americans might begin to reassess their relationship to the health system and specifically to the hospitals. I, I have moments where I get really down about this because the way healthcare workers have been treated, the way nurses have suffered through this. But then at the same time, I'm not totally pessimistic in the ways we were talking about before that Americans, when we move through the next phase of this, will look back and say, wow, it's really the hospitals and the healthcare workers that kept this country afloat. Yeah, I think it's a really, really complicated uh, issue and, and set of problems um, because you're absolutely right. There is that <clears throat> that dimension of empathy, of, of care and and connection. Uh, and we've certainly seen that <clears throat> um, play out. Yet at the same time, there's a, a degree at both the, the the specific and the general level that this is a really problematic system that does not actually, first of all, it doesn't actually work well uh, for a lot of people, uh, whether in normal times, whatever that now means, or even during the pandemic, as we see with, you know, having access to quality care. And it's not that those hospitals that were producing those higher death rates, for the most part, were indifferent. It was a matter of, of resources and, and skill um, and, and, uh, and, and the, the situation they were in. Um, but there are a couple other pieces to this that, you know, if we go back at least to, to the 1940s and arguably earlier than that, we made a societal decision to really centralize the hospital as the core locus of care, really the, 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 the center of the healthcare system. And it's not exactly a zero sum game, but that did, I think, have a couple of consequences that it led to underinvestment in public health and the kind of public health structures hmm. that would have been ideally, uh, uh, in, in many respects, more effective at implementing the kind of preventive measures that we might have done better at containing um, the pandemic. Um, I You're think talking about even, decentralized clinics and, and mobile yeah. units and the deployment yeah. of public health response right. rather than and, and supplying. Capacity, you know, that, right. that we might have actually been able yeah. to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Or we would have had possibly a more effective structure for getting tests out. Um, yeah. This is a little more speculative, but I even wonder if some of that focus on this massive clinical institution that provides treatment with a capital T has shifted cultural attitudes in ways that have made people more resistant to things like masking, uh, maybe even vaccination. And that has a long, long history too. Um, but, you know, I, I think we've seen, even among people who are resistant to vaccines or, or masking, they're first in line for monoclonal antibodies. You know, they're, they're open to treatment 
but prevention is not part of our health culture. Um, so I, I don't know, that one's harder for me to nail down, but I do wonder wow. about you know, whether we've had some very deep level effects of this focus on the institution. And of course, the, the, um, the other side of this goes back to the larger problems of our health, healthcare system, and um, particularly the inability to uh, really build out some form of effective universal uh, health coverage. And, you know, I think the ACA did about as well as it could have in, in the circumstances, and I'm a huge supporter of it. It's also not the system I would build uh, from the ground up. And this is the other thing that, that the book, my book really tries to do is trace that story back and show how the growing costs of the system and specifically the hospital system fed back into a difficulty to reform the wider uh, healthcare system in the United States. The number of times that healthcare reform was at least constrained or completely defeated and <clears throat> how often that was tied um, uh, to, to cost and specifically hospital costs. And as soon as you moved to constrain that cost, you know, every co member of Congress has a hospital in their district yeah, and sure. you know, influential people serve on the boards and, you know, a significant percentage of their constituents work there or have received tra treatment there, yeah. have those kind of personal connections to the hospital. So it's these institutions that we feel connected to and that we love and that do a lot of positive things, but have also, you know, and again, not out of necessarily malice in any kind of sense, but following institutional interests have contributed significantly to this fragmented, expensive and deeply inefficient and unjust, unequal healthcare system that, that we have in, in this country. So there's so many levels of this, you know, and I, yeah. You know, I, I'm not I'm not entirely or I don't want to come off as bashing hospitals because I do, you know, recognize you know that that role of empathy and care. And you know, I my family has benefited from it like everyone else. And we haven't even talked about the research role of you know academic medical centers, which is significant too. But you know, we also do have to, I think, consider these wider implications and the context in which the system operates and how that relates to some of the outcomes we've seen in the, in the pandemic. Now, you're really good at describing it at, the, at, the, at different scales. And, and I, I've, I can't help but wonder, you know, sometimes I think about the mission-driven nature of medicine and nursing and, um, and even and, you know, the janitorial staffs. I mean, everyone who's engaged in what a hospital does, um, that you could have the worst system in the world and they will still achieve amazing things. So you have, you know, you have the professional culture and the culture of care that's going on inside this other, this other structure. I mean, it's a kind of, an, it's, it's, it's an age old problem of, of governance of any big institution generally, that oftentimes it rises or falls based on the commitment of people inside to, to deliver whatever expertise yeah. they need to, they need yeah. to deliver. But I, I wonder, I mean, we're out of time, but I just ask you sort of a, if you see this as a, again, sort of possible moment of reform, if there's greater emphasis on unionization, let's say, if there's mm -hmm. greater emphasis on raising um, wages for medical residents, for attending to the PTSD that's gonna follow for doctors and nurses coming out of this. I mean, I, maybe that's not the right way to think about it, but I am always somehow hopeful that institutions can crack open and reform if we do see the injustices of that are being visited on the people inside, not to mention patients, but I'm just talking about healthcare workers here. Right, absolutely. Well, I'll give you a negative and a positive. Um, the negative is I've seen that commitment and that sense of mission, <clears throat> particularly when we're talking about the more service uh, level workers being used as an argument against unionization. You know, that's, that's happened <clears throat> from hospital administrators, uh, you know, it, repeatedly. And it's sort of a, the mission becomes a substitute for a living wage almost, which is is really problematic and can be exploited. So I guess that is an area area where there's there's some malice going on. Um, the more positive side, though, uh, is looking forward. And I uh, I'll start with the mental health. You know, I think there really has been um, a recognition 
that mental health is is critical. We saw the Lorna Breen um, uh, a Caregiver Act. I don't have the name exactly right, but Lorna Breen was a, a physician who was in New York um, during the initial surge and is actually from Charlottesville and took her own life last spring. And that led to um, you know, a, a, a significant shift in investment in mental health care for, for, her, for um, uh, uh, clinical workers. So I think that kind of thing is important, but I think it's there's maybe more recognition there uh, at the hospital level that they really have to pay attention to this and and provide resources. Um, you know, obviously the other thing we haven't really touched on is uh, the the staff shortages that hospitals have increasingly experienced, and um, I think this is part of a larger shift in labor markets in general. Um, some of it is obviously the immediate effects of the pandemic, but the demographics of this country are shifting in, re in, in really notable ways that the uh, number of young people entering the workforce um, it's, it's, has, is, is, is dropping. And it's dropped every decade since I think the 1980s. And we're starting to see that play out, I think, in hiring dynamics. And um, that may shift a little bit as you, you know you move out of the pandemic, but the larger structural uh, issues in um, the economy generally are are not mm. are, are are not going to change. And they I think they do shift a degree of economic power towards workers generally. And in a, an environment like uh, healthcare, hospitals specifically. Um, I think that's going to play out to a direction of um, workers needing to be treated better simply for hospitals to attract enough, uh, enough staff. Um, that may, may be unionization. It may be, um, you know, simply more of a willingness to improve conditions and, and wages. Um, so, I, so the sum of that is, yeah, I think, you know, the, the pandemics are the kinds, um, of events, let alone, you know, wars in Europe, um, no. that, you know, the, the world is changing and we're not, yeah. we're not going back to, you know, November of 2019 and, um, mm. you know, that can go in a lot of ways. Um, but on that, I think, I, I, I do think there's a possibility of seeing some really positive changes in the healthcare system, the way people are treated in the way care is provided. Um, you know, I, my ideal is that we see both an improvement in conditions for the people who work in the institutions, but also a restructuring of the institutions, maybe a little bit away from those, you know, gleamy medical complexes um, towards different kinds of, of, uh, of ways to provide services and maybe even to pay for them, which is a whole nother episode. But um, there's some things we can do on the financing side that would also change the, the, the system in positive ways. Let me just remind folks that you've been listening to COVID calls and it's a big day on COVID calls of another episode starting in just a few minutes. Actually, I'll be talking with physicians, Carla Kearns and Emily Hansen. So please do tune in for that about, uh, they'll be talking about life on the medical front lines during the pandemic. And I wanna take a moment here to thank my friend and, and guest and overall genius, Gian McKee. I always enjoy spending time with you and I uh, really want to congratulate you in advance on this work. Hospital City, Healthcare Nation, Race, Capital and the Costs of American Healthcare. We'll be looking for that and people can also keep up with your work at the Miller Center at the University of Virginia. Gian, thanks for your time. Thanks for all you do and keep after it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This has been fun. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time on COVID Calls.